Act 3. You are listening to a story of America's First Christmas, as written by author John Antell, and described in his book, Seven Leadership Lessons of the American Revolution. The primary parts of this story are read by John Antell as George Washington, Jeff Bolton as narrator, and Edward Brace as Henry Knox and Colonel Rawl. It is Christmas Day. The men prepare. Some wax the flash pans of their muskets to keep their gunpowder from the rain. Others sharpen bayonets. Some pray. No one has time for a Christmas celebration. During the day, Washington has Thomas Paine's new pamphlet read to the troops. The words of Paine, who has been marching with the army since July, encourage the men. The pamphlet starts. These are the times, These are the times that, try that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. General George Washington has assembled nearly 2,400 men for the crossing, ready to battle tyranny. Two additional forces, each with about 700 men, will cross further to the south of Trenton to cut off any chance of the Hessians' retreat. Around 5 p.m., it is dark and the loading begins. The weather worsens as sleeting rain turns horizontal, stinging the men's faces. Delays occur. The darkness makes everything harder. Washington's soldiers huddle in the cold as they board the boats. Men shiver, slip, and curse. Colonel Henry Knox commands the movement of men to the boats as Colonel John Glover is in charge of the loading, ferrying the men across and unloading them on the New Jersey side. The first boat starts the crossing with Washington and his hand-picked Virginia riflemen. The sky fills with snow and sleet as the boat slowly navigates the swift-flowing Delaware River. It is difficult to see very far ahead. Glover's expert seamen with rows and poles get the first boat safely across. The Virginia riflemen that accompany Washington quickly secure the landing area. Washington moves ashore. There were no British troops to oppose them. More boats continue the same process but are having problems finding the landing spot. General Washington looks at his pocket watch and realizes that the crossing is already off schedule. Then, in the snowy haze, a large figure moves towards Washington. General Washington, is that you? Henry, what are you doing on this side of the river? I thought you planned to keep things moving on the Pennsylvania side. Sir, in this blasted weather, our boats can't find the landing point. I've come over to help at this end. I have good men in charge of the loading. This is the more critical point. Good decision, Henry. But now, how do you expect to help those boats find our landing point? Sir, you will see. Washington watches as Henry moves out of view towards the shore. Over here! Over here! The landing point is here! In the middle of the Delaware, the boatmen use their long wooden poles to move towards the sound of Colonel Knox's thunderous voice. Glover's boatmen home in on Knox's shouts, and the passengers debark. Men climb out of the boats, soaked with driving rain in the frigid water of the Delaware River. Knox stays at it, boat after boat, but all this takes time. As men huddle together, shaking with cold, Washington takes a risk and orders the men to build campfires. The snowstorm is so bad, Washington can't see five feet in front of his face. Better to keep his men warm than worry if the Hessians might see the fires. With Knox shouting in the distance, Washington pulls the collar of his coat to cover his neck from the icy air. He tugs on his watch chain in the dim light and checks the time. His plans call for the army to be across the river by midnight, in marching on Triton at 1 a.m. It is now nearly 2 a.m. and the cannon are still to cross. He knows that to win the battle, he must get his cannon into the fight. Colonel Knox approaches. General Washington, sir, the first of my cannon are coming ashore, but we won't move them all until 4 a.m. This means that we will be at Trenton after sunrise. The Hessians will be up and ready. We won't have any surprise. General Washington remains silent, contemplating Knox's comment. General... If we turn back, we can cross the army back to Pennsylvania before noon. In this weather, the Hessians may not discover us. Henry, it's now or never. We must all resolve to be determined to succeed. We must keep going forward. Henry Knox saluted and went back to work. The crossing continued and the weather turned into a blizzard. The army is nearly assembled. Colonel John Glover and his boatmen are the last of Washington's force to cross. Glover's men are weary, but ready for a fight. 
Colonel Glover approaches General Washington. General, I'm the last man across. I also have word from our other two columns that you ordered from the river to the south of us. Well, Glover, are they across? No, sir. They couldn't cross the river. They tried, but the current was too swift, and they couldn't get their cannon across. It looks like it's just us. Washington nodded, not saying a word. He looked at his watch. It was 4 a.m. We can't make it to Trenton before daylight. I don't suppose you want us to assemble the boats and row back to Pennsylvania? No. We move forward. If we quit, it's over, Glover. It's all over. If we move forward, we can create opportunities. I didn't think you'd want to turn around, General. My men and I are in this with you till the end. Of course, you know, much of our powder is wet. Many of the men will not be able to fire their muskets. Washington paused with a look on his face that seemed to say, What? More bad news? Don't worry, sir. The men are working to recharge their firearms. Enough full work when needed. Powder or no, give the word that we will use the bayonet. It's time to give the Hessians a Christmas present. Glover smiles, shakes hands with General Washington, and moves back to his men. Washington mounts his horse and gives the orders to march to Trenton. The army moves in one large column as silently as possible. On his command, the army will split into two columns, one moving along the upper road and one the lower road, under General Sullivan, to attack Trenton from all sides. The snow continues to fall, and Washington's horse has trouble moving on the icy road. Men strain at the cannons, pushing them along while the horses neigh and struggle to pull the guns forward. The ground is slippery, but the men overcome the ice. They have trouble crossing Jacob's Creek, which is nearly a river from all the rain and snow, but they cross it with all the cannon and press on. The army inches toward Trenton as the fury of the snowstorm rages. Suddenly, A group of four or five horsemen are seen through the snowfall, headed towards Washington's army. Washington, who is near the front of the column, draws his pistol. Henry Knox, who is riding at Washington's side, moves over to put himself in front of the general to protect the commander from his enemy. Prepare to receive cavalry. Hold your fire until I give the order. The horsemen draw close, then stop. A man dismounts and walks forward cautiously. General Washington, sir, is that you? Yes. Who, sir, are you? General, Adam Steffen, Captain of New Jersey Military Militia, at your service, sir. It is wonderful to see you. We hit the Hessians in Trenton about four hours ago. Shot them up pretty well. Killed a few. I think and caused the great fuss. They've been out after us all night, but they never caught us. You, sir, may have ruined all my plans by having them put on their guard. General, I don't understand. My apologies. But I didn't know of any plans. Washington looked at the New Jersey militia captain and shook his head. General, the Hessians will be waiting for us in full battle order. What are your orders? These are the times that try men's souls. Sir, I couldn't hear you. Nothing. Keep the men moving. The column will split in two at the fork of the road up ahead. On to Trenton. The cold black night began to turn gray. Soon it was to be sunrise. Washington will have to attack the Hessians in broad daylight, and he knows that Colonel Rawl always has his men in formation, standing at arms, at dawn. You are listening to a story of America's first Christmas, as written by author John Antell, and described in his book, Seven Leadership Lessons of the American Revolution. The primary parts of the story are read by John Antell as General Washington, Jeff Bolton as narrator, and Edward Braze as Henry Knox and Colonel Rawl.